All right, guys, how's it going? Sometimes you have an idea for a video in your mind and it doesn't quite turn out as expected. And this is pretty much what happened with this video. It was supposed to be a video on Vulcan, but then it kind of morphed into like a history of APIs and the fact of the matter is, there's not an awful lot to be said about Vulcan right now anyway. There are many similarities between Vulcan and DX12 and not an awful lot of differences. So hopefully you'll get something out of this video. It's been quite a difficult one for me to do as I am much more of a hardware guy than a software guy. But hopefully you'll find it interesting anyway. So let's go on with it. So we'll start with pre-Windows. Back in the old days, I'm talking the mid 80s to the 90s, we had gaming computers like the Commodore Amiga, the Atari ST, both of which I owned. There were obviously a few consoles around at that time as well, the Super Nintendo, your Sega Mega Drive, stuff like that. And PC gaming was a bit of a joke, in all honesty. And one of the reasons for that was getting games to run on a PC was pretty difficult. If you were born in the 90s and onwards, some of this stuff is just gonna sound crazy. But in order to get games running on a PC, you had to set up your sound card. Based on your game, you had to do strange things with your memory, trying to save conventional and base memory. Games just simply would not work unless you had like your auto exec batch file set up properly. So this was a common sight, stuff like this where you had to choose whatever sound card you had. It was totally different from stuff like the consoles and your Amigas and your Atari STs. The big difference was these were known quantities. If you were a games developer developing for one of those games PCs or for a games console, you knew exactly what the hardware was. You simply did not know what it was going to be in a PC. So it was down to both the developer and the end user to configure their computer in order to play games. Now back in those days, there was no Windows either. It was simply DOS, or Windows really hadn't taken off. However, Microsoft had a plan to make Windows the operating system of choice. And we all know how that one worked out. And part of that plan was to make PC compatibility much less of an issue. And in many ways, this is why Windows was so successful. Every part that was made had a driver that worked with Windows and all these compatibility issues were coming to an end. Pre-Windows, most of this stuff was done low level. The coding was much more difficult and you really had to know the hardware that you were coding for. When Windows and DirectX came along, much of the hardware became abstracted. For example, instead of coding to a specific graphics card's memory pool, DirectX would do all that memory management. It put compatibility first and performance later. However, if you're a games developer, you're always going to take the compatibility, so long as the performance can be acceptable. And this is what Microsoft DirectX tried to achieve. Now it should be said that OpenGL, which is another graphics API, was around before DirectX existed. A company called SGI developed OpenGL, mostly for high-end workstation graphics, computer-aided design, that sort of thing. One of the biggest issues of having an API, rather than coding directly to the graphics card, is that every time you add a new technology to a graphics card, the API needs to keep up with it. In the early days, this wasn't so much of an issue. However, OpenGL generally did a better job. For example, a company called 3DFX developed a technology called multi-texturing, and it wasn't long before OpenGL had what is known as an extension which enabled multi-texturing on OpenGL. Back then, DirectX was normally a few months behind because Microsoft had to write a new version of DirectX to take advantage of all the new technologies that were arriving. So what was DirectX 3 became DirectX 5. There was no 4. Then NVIDIA added a technology known as transform and lighting to their famous GeForce 256 graphics card, very first GeForce graphics card. Now OpenGL already had the ability to do transform and lighting, but we had to wait until DirectX 7 a few months later. So back then OpenGL was pretty good and through extensions was able to enable hardware that little bit faster than what Microsoft could do. However, over the years, it just seemed to get worse. OpenGL just got more and more bloated. It got slower, the driver overhead seemed to get worse, and the gap between it and DirectX just seemed to widen. Around about the DirectX 8 and 9 era, Microsoft and Nvidia were working very closely together, so new graphics cards and new versions of DirectX were launching around the same time. At that time, we had stuff called shader models appearing, shader model 1, 2, etc. NVIDIA's only real competition at the time was ATI. Everybody else had fallen by the wayside. Now AMD acquired ATI in 2006. And a lot started to change about that time because AMD had different plans for integrating CPU and GPU together to create APUs. 
Now, by 2010, both AMD and NVIDIA were working very, very closely with Microsoft so that the newest API would be compatible with their newest graphics cards. However, AMD was starting to notice that much of their stuff was going unused. And there was a very interesting article over at bittech.net where AMD's Richard Huddy started talking about getting rid of DirectX. Now, this was the 16th of March 2011. Huddy was talking about AMD and PC game developers directly coding low-level to the hardware rather than having to go through an API such as DirectX. He was quite scathing, in fact, saying stuff like DirectX is getting in the way. And I'm sure, as you all know, some 30 months later, AMD and DICE revealed Mantle, the low-level graphics API for AMD Radeon graphics cards. Now, this 9x better performance I certainly did not see. However, it soon became clear that Mantle had some large advantages over DirectX 11. Now, I have talked about those advantages in previous videos, but the obvious advantage is the CPU multi-threading. Up until this point, OpenGL and DirectX were very single-threaded in nature. And that meant that very few CPU cores were actually being used. And in all too many games, the graphics cards were being held back because the game could only run as fast as the single thread of the fastest CPU. I'm pretty sure we all know that AMD CPUs have been struggling pretty badly with single threaded performance for the past five years. Another big reason for AMD's push was asynchronous compute which is something they had added to their graphics cards at the end of 2011 with their GCN architecture. In a way, this is multi-threading for GPUs. So they're certainly trying to push the whole multi-threaded thing here. In the end, they got fed up waiting on Microsoft. And instead of waiting any longer, they created Mantle. Now, I've already talked for six or seven minutes and I haven't mentioned Vulkan yet, so I'm going to change that now. As you can see from this slide from AMD's recent Capsaicin event, if you just start at the left hand side, you can see Mantle was here in the first quarter of 2014. In the third quarter of 2014, we can see Metal, which is the low level API developed by Apple for their own iOS operating system. Then we can see DirectX 12 a whole year after Mantle. And up at the top right, we can see Liquid VR, which is based on Mantle, and not a lot of people realize that. Finally, right at the far end, in the first quarter of 2016, Vulcan was released. Now, you can quite clearly see there, with the red lines, what this means. Basically speaking, at a low level, Vulcan and Mantle are the same thing. AMD handed over Mantle to the Kronos Group. The Kronos Group was founded in 2000 by companies including ATI, Intel, NVIDIA, SGI, and in 2006, the group took control of OpenGL. Nowadays, it's got around about 120 members, and its current president is Neil Trevet of NVIDIA. So basically speaking, the Kronos Group took control of OpenGL, and now AMD handed Mantle over to the Kronos Group, and they basically decided on a clean break. OpenGL still exists, however, going forward, they are clearly going to be putting everything behind Vulkan. With the rest of the industry moving to these low-level APIs, they really had no choice. Now, you can clearly see that Vulkan is actually two years behind Mantle. So what is the reason for that delay? Well, obviously, AMD didn't instantly realize that they'd be giving Mantle away. And Mantle only worked on AMD's own GCN graphics cards. And even then, it only worked on Windows 7 and Windows 8. The whole point of OpenGL was that it was cross-platform, multi-vendor. So Vulkan, as its spiritual successor, has to be the same. It has to work on all vendors' graphics cards, not just AMD's. So it needs to be adapted for NVIDIA, for Intel, Qualcomm, any company that makes graphics. And instead of only working on Windows, it needs to work on Linux, it needs to work on SteamOS. And this is the main point of Vulkan, to give games and applications developers the most exposure for their product. Effectively, they should be able to make a game that will run on any operating system and on any hardware. And that indeed is the main difference between Vulkan, DirectX 12 and Apple's Metal. The biggest beneficiary of Vulkan is likely to be Valve with their SteamOS. Valve has been crying out for something like this for a very long time. Now, SteamOS is, of course, based on Linux, the Debian distribution, I believe. And you can see here that after Windows, SteamOS on Linux is in the clear second place for the number of games. Valve has been porting games from DirectX to OpenGL for a few years now, and there's been a real war of words between Microsoft and Valve, mostly due to Microsoft's attempts with games for Windows Live and the Windows Store. Simply put, Microsoft wants that publisher cut that Valve has. 
and Valve doesn't want them to get it. So you can imagine just how much Valve needed something like Vulcan rather than falling further behind due to OpenGL not being able to keep up with DX12. Like I said near the beginning of the video, there are many similarities between DirectX 12 and Vulkan. As you can see from this slide here, from GDC last August, they basically share an identical philosophy, the same as Mantle's. It's all about minimizing driver overhead, more multi-threading, asynchronous queues, and the explicit access to multiple devices when you can use like an AMD and an Nvidia card together or even Intel integrated graphics and an AMD graphics card for example and all that stuff is great. There is however an issue that is currently being seen in the early DirectX 12 games and it's one that I talked about earlier. This stuff is difficult, it is a lot more difficult than DirectX 11 and OpenGL and this low level memory management is causing some issues. Let's have a look at what some of the developers are saying about that. Over at Anantech, Microsoft and Oxide Games had a chat with Ryan Smith and again some of the topics I've gone over were reiterated. DirectX 12 and other low level APIs are not for the faint of heart and making effective use of it will require more guru level programmers who can work with a video card without all of the hand holding that came with DirectX 11 and earlier APIs. And again, making effective use of DX12 requires a better understanding of the underlying hardware and how to best treat it. And down near the bottom, they move on to memory, a uniquely PC perspective. Now again, we're talking about DX12, however, this is going to be the same for Vulkan. They start talking about the consoles. Both the current generation of consoles, that is the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, have 8 gigabyte of memory. Now, not all of that is usable, but the developers know exactly what they have to play with. On the PC, however, video RAM in a graphics card varies wildly between 2 gigabyte and 8 gigabyte for the most recent cards. Now, under DX11, memory management was typically a driver problem, and the drivers usually got it right. In other words, it was up to AMD and Nvidia to fix their DX11 drivers, but now DX12 and Vulkan hands all of this control over to the game developers themselves, and with great power comes great responsibility. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that Oxide, who are responsible for Ashes of the Singularity, which is the first true DX12 game, Oxide have developed a new strategy to deal with memory management, though it has taken some time to do so. A couple of weeks ago, Rise of the Tomb Raider got its DX12 patch, and the results were pretty interesting to say the least. Over at the Tech Buyers Guru, we got some early benchmarks. Now this is the built-in benchmark, so it may not be representative of the main game. Here you can see that in the built-in benchmark, you've got a bunch of cars ranging from the R9 290 all the way up to the GTX 980 Ti. The averages are in the red and green, with the minimums blue and yellow. The game is of course a Gameworks title and is very friendly to Nvidia. And here, under DX11, you can see how badly the AMD cards fare, especially in minimum frame rates. Now most people believe that this is always memory related. When you see dips like that, it's got to be memory. But you're talking about an 8 gigabyte R9 390X here. And here's a 3.5 gigabyte 970 getting 15.5. So this is not memory that's causing these dips. This is DX11 being very single threaded and the AMD cards are getting choked due to the driver overhead. This is the sort of thing you would expect to see go away under DirectX 12. And when we look at the DirectX 12 benchmark, we see that the averages don't really change an awful lot. However, the minimums crater on all the Nvidia cards, whereas the R9 390X actually gains an awful lot in minimum frame rate. In a situation like this, it's quite possible that the R9 390X is the most playable card here, simply because the minimums are so much better. Certainly in this case the R9 390X would be better than the GTX 980, though possibly not as good as the 980 Ti. But the interesting thing is, of course, the R9 390X has the most memory of all the cards here. So when the 390X is no longer being choked by the single thread, it is able to maintain much higher minimum frame rates, while the Nvidia cards crater and it must be because of the memory. Again, the GTX 970, four gigabyte or 3.5 gigabyte. You've got four gigabyte on the 980 and six gigabyte on the 980 Ti. Only four gigabyte on the R9 290 and eight gigabyte, of course, on the R9 390X. This is a very clear indication of a VRAM problem. And further down, we can see this pretty clearly. The Nvidia cards are pretty much capped out, whereas the R9 390X still has around about 1 gigabyte of spare VRAM. This is just all about the developers not managing the memory properly. 
whatever they've been used to doing under DX11, which in effect was just letting DX11 deal with it, and then if that wasn't good enough, AMD or Nvidia would have to deal with it. Now we are seeing a case where the games developers need to deal with these VRAM issues better and aren't really doing it. Now it's important to note that the developers of Rise of the Tomb Raider were involved with Mantle right from the very beginning and worked very, very closely with AMD and really should know better than this. And it doesn't really bode well for the future if these guru level programmers who have been involved with Mantle, bringing out games in DX12 and hopefully Vulkan in the future still can't manage VRAM properly. That does not bode well at all. The last thing I want to go over here before I wrap this video up is that in a lot of DX12 games we are seeing a regression. In fact, it has only really been Hitman and Ashes of the Singularity that have shown an overall improvement with DX12 compared to DX11. And that is very likely to be down to the developer's close relationship with AMD. However, in Rise of the Tomb Raider, we can quite clearly see that DX11 is ahead of DX12. So what exactly is going on there? It shouldn't really happen, should it? If we go over everything that we've talked about, all the multi-threading, why are we seeing this when games switch to DX12? My belief is that we're seeing an issue here with CPU turbos. Now, as you probably know, when only one core is being used, your CPU gains quite a large turbo. But if all of your cores are being used, the turbo is much less. So what we could be seeing here is a case where the work is being spread over all the cores in the CPU, and even though it's not an awful lot of work, it's still enough for the CPU to throttle down to its lowest turbo level. I'm not entirely sure about that, but it's what makes sense to me. If we take a look at Hitman CPU scaling, going from DX11 to DX12, we can see that AMD are gaining a massive amount here. Their abysmal performance under DX11 is much better under DX12. In this case, the Intel CPU also gains, but it's much less. And again, this sort of makes me feel that this is a game where obviously AMD have been heavily involved and they do seem to be more on the ball with this sort of thing as they really should be. We may actually find that Intel and AMD do more kinds of optimization here. That's certainly one to look out for in the future. The point I'm trying to make here though is, yes, DX12 and Vulkan are going to be great for gaming, but it's not going to be happening this year. This time next year maybe, which might be good news for Vulkan because Vulkan is a year behind. So while the developers are learning DX12, all their memory management stuff, all this CPU turbo stuff, because of the similarities between Vulkan and DX12, we'd expect that any improvements that come from DX12 will also carry forward to Vulkan. In the end, the developers all want to be on Vulkan. The only companies that want DX12 to succeed, Microsoft and possibly even AMD. At the recent Capsaicin event, there was a lot of talk about DX12 and very little talk about Vulkan. And I think that because Vulkan is based on Mantle, that most people imagined that AMD would be more behind Vulkan. In actual fact, Nvidia is more behind Vulkan than AMD is. But you've got to look at it from AMD's point of view. They are basically arming both sides here. And that way you can't really lose either way. But in all honesty, AMD's got a massive win here anyway. When it comes to gaming, I would expect AMD's Zen CPU architecture to be on par with Intel anyway. But that's one for another video again. The very, very last thing I want to talk about is the Talus Principle Vulkan benchmark, the one and only Vulkan gaming benchmark that we currently have. Now, when this first came out, a lot of people were very disappointed. And it's not hard to see why, as the red Vulkan bar is an absolute mile behind the blue DirectX 11 bar. So people were very disappointed in this, but it's just one of those cases where this is not a true Vulkan game. I've talked about this quite a lot. When you simply modify a DX11 game to DX12, you get very minor gains. In this case, the Talus principle on OpenGL was simply given a Vulkan wrapper and the end result was very mediocre indeed. I wouldn't worry about this at all. There is no reason why Vulkan, which is based on Mantle, should not be performing very similarly to DX12. That one remains to be seen though, but like I said, it's probably going to be a little while before we see much more of Vulkan. As always, there'll be a bunch of links in the description below, and I'm pretty sure there'll be a lively chat as well. So let me know if you've got any questions or comments, and I'll catch you later guys.